1989, these words were printed in an appeal for church unity by the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference. The world church has never viewed these subjects, the nature of Christ and the nature of sin, as essential to salvation, nor to the mission of the remnant church. There can be no strong unity within the world church of God's remnant people, so long as segments who hold these views vocalize and agitate them, both in North America and in overseas divisions. These topics need to be laid aside and not urged upon our people as necessary issues. Well, as I have thought about this subject, as much as I would like to agree and comply with this request, in my study, I have found that the subject of the nature of Christ is crucially important for our understanding of salvation and the atonement of Jesus Christ. So let's go back. Why did Jesus Christ come down to this earth? Well, Satan had challenged God's ways and God's handling of the sin problem. And Jesus Christ came down to this earth for a very specific reason. In John 8, 26, it says, He that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Jesus is saying, I came to reveal my Father. I came to prove that Satan is misstating and not correctly understanding who God is. In John 14.10, Jesus told Philip, The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Jesus is, has come to state and to live what God, who God really is and what his, what his character is like. Someone wrote in a very pertinent letter to um, the Adventist Review. He came to the, war to the world that the erroneous ideas Satan had been the means of creating in the minds of men in regard to the character of God might be removed. We often think that the reason he came to this world was to save sinners. Yes, that is true. But even more important than that was to reveal his character. Again, in the letter, Jesus came to teach men of the Father. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of his Father was made manifest to men. So Jesus came to prove that Satan was lying about who God is and about his character. So, what were Satan's charges? Well, we'll read one of them. Uh, from Patriarchs and Pro from Christ Triumphant, page 51. Satan's charge was that human beings cannot keep God's law. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 37, he began to insinuate doubts concerning the laws that govern heavenly beings. Page 38, he urged that changes in the order and laws of heaven were necessary for the stability of the divine government. In other words, we don't need the way the laws of God are structured. And he said that before sin ever entered into the picture. So I call that charge A. Angels and unfallen beings don't need the law of God. We can operate very well on our own. But that isn't the only charge that he has made. Here is another charge that is, is very clear. After the fall of man, Satan declared that human beings were proved to be incapable of keeping the law of God. Notice, after the fall of man, that's Selected Messages, Volume 1, 252 and 253. Same book, 255 and 256. Christ's humanity would demonstrate for eternal ages the question which settled the controversy. In taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in, his, in its sin. Here's another one. Manuscript releases, page, uh, f volume 5, page 112. Satan, the fallen angel, had declared that no man could keep the law after the disobedience of Adam. He claimed the whole race under his control. 
In Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 136, we have these statements very clearly outlined. Another one, Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God, and thus charged upon God a lack of wisdom and love. If they could not keep the law, then there was fault with the lawgiver. If they could not keep the law, there was fault with the lawgiver. Jesus humbled himself, clothing his divinity with humanity, in order that he might stand as the head and representative of the human family, and by both precept and example condemn sin in the flesh and give the lie to Satan's charges. Signs of the Times, January 16, 1896. So Satan's charge was clearly leveled against fallen man's ability to keep the law, that we cannot keep the law. Another one, he, he came to this world to be tempted in all points as we are to prove to the universe that in this world of sin, human beings can live lives that God will approve. Satan declared that human beings could not live without sin. Review and Herald, Volume 5, page 120. And so we have several statements here that uh, are very clear that his charge related not only to Adam and Eve and the angels in heaven, but to us who live with fallen natures in a sinful world. One more from My Life Today, page 323. Part of Christ's mission consisted in revealing to the heavenly universe, to Satan, and to all the fallen sons and daughters of Adam that through his grace, humanity can keep the law of God. I call this charge B. Charge A was against Adam and Eve, all unfallen beings, angels. Charge B was against fallen human beings in this world of sin. Now, how could Christ prove that Satan was wrong? What if he had taken an unfallen nature? He would have disproved charge A, that those who are living in a perfect environment with a perfect nature, they can keep God's law. But what would he have proved about us who live, in an un, who live in a fallen nature, in a sinful world? Would he have proved anything for that at all? And so we have a very crucial issue here. Did Christ fully refute and disprove Satan's arguments as he brought them against the law of God? If Satan's argument that fallen men and women cannot keep the law of God was not disproved by Jesus Christ, then who has disproved Satan's charge, charge B? Only if Christ took man's fallen nature could he prove that fallen human beings can obey the law of God. A letter writer said it very well. Along with two-thirds of the original number of angels, despite Satan's fiercest attempts to tempt and deceive them, despite their having only a partial knowledge of the nature and results of sin, not a single being in the many other inhabited worlds has yielded to sin and lost his right to eternal life. If the Son of the Most High God had taken on human flesh just to prove that sinless beings with sinless natures can perfectly keep God's law, we would have had an infinitely infinite humiliation to prove the already and obviously proven. There could have been no greater, more costly, more tragic exercise in futility. In other words, if Jesus Christ came to earth only to prove that unfallen beings can obey God's law that had already been proven, because that had been proven by angels, two-thirds of the angels. That had been proven by all beings on unfallen worlds. And so if he came to prove that, what a tragic exercise in futility is what the letter writer says. But Jesus came to prove more than that. He came to prove that not only unfallen beings, but fallen beings could obey God's law, both charges A and charge B. And the only way he could do that was by taking 
our nature. One individual astutely observed a long time ago, those who teach that Christ took a superior human nature draw the logical conclusion that it is impossible for the rest of mankind to perfectly obey the law of Jehovah in this life. All right. In other words, the first reason for Christ to take a fallen nature was to refute Satan's charge and provide an atonement. If Christ did not refute Satan's charge, the atonement would be incomplete because Satan's charges would still stand that we, fallen human beings, cannot obey the law of God. So for Christ to be our sinless substitute, he had to take our nature to prove that Satan was lying. And then there's another issue here. Revelation chapter 14 verse 5 describes the last people on this earth. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Can God really carry out that promise? Can he find among these sinners on this planet people who will be without sin? Can he make that happen? And so once again, if Christ proved that Adam and Eve could have obeyed, unfallen beings could obey, angels could obey, then has he proved that fallen human beings can obey completely, perfectly, without sinning. So if he took unfallen nature, he would not have proved anything about whether you and I, who live on this earth, can ever live without sinning before Jesus comes. Only if he took fallen nature and lived a perfect life can he prove that sinners like us can also live without sinning. This statement comes from Review and Herald, May 7, 1901. God requires of man nothing that is impossible for him to do. Christ kept the law, proving beyond controversy that man also can keep it. That means that the 144,000 living without sinning after the close of probation is more than a theoretical possibility. Christ showed by his example that human beings following the pattern of Christ can have the same result. And there will be a people that will be live without sinning. A very poignant statement is made in Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 929, from Ellen White. In our conclusions, we make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. When we give to his human nature a power that is not possible for man to have in his conflicts with Satan, we destroy, notice, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. I don't have an unfallen nature, a power that is impossible for me to have before Jesus comes. And if we give to his human nature a power that I cannot have, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. I found a very interesting thing in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is not a Seventh-day Adventist document. God gave to Adam a law as a covenant of works by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience, promised life upon the fulfilling, and threatened death upon the breach of it, and endued him with power and ability to keep it. Now that's talking about Adam. And God gave Adam this power to keep the law through his perfect nature, Adam's perfect nature. And now we have to ask the next question, does he also give to us that kind of power? Fallen human beings. And the only way that can be clearly seen and proven is if Christ took fallen human nature. Charge B of Satan. Fallen human beings cannot obey the law of God. 
And so I think that the nature of Christ is very essential, not unessential, to understanding and living the gospel of righteousness by faith in these end times. I thought you might be interested in a few other little things that have come down on this subject in recent years. In 1994, the Review and Herald published a book called The Nature of Christ, Help for a Church Divided Over Perfection. And here is what this said. My thesis throughout is that the theology of these three men, A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagoner, and M.L. Andreessen, has provided the spawning ground for the position on righteousness by faith and perfection held by certain Adventists today. Without a doubt, the roots of the present agitation go all the way back to Jones and Wagoner. Now this book was an open opposition to the 1888 message. But it is very interesting that here was a clear admission that historic righteousness by faith, including the possibility of living without sin, comes directly from the 1888 message. This was the root of that understanding of the gospel. And so that becomes an interesting idea. By the way, just so you have another uh, um, perspective on this. Desmond Ford... Um, wrote about this book that, we have been, that we're discussing right now. At last, he said, after a generation and a half, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has published a book devoted entirely to the vital subject of the sinless nature of Christ, our Savior. The denomination's publishing houses have hesitated to proclaim that truth in any publication, that truth in any publication of scholarly responses. I recommend, Dr. Ford said, Roy Adams' book wholeheartedly. It reminds me of Perfect in Christ by Helmut Ott, which was published in 1987 by the same publishers. Roy Adams, The Nature of Christ is, as far as I know, a first in Adventist publications. It is the first official SDA book to affirm the sinless nature of Christ, our Lord and Savior. So there we have an interesting admission that this book that says that Christ took our sinless nature is breaking new ground it's not in the mainstream. It's not what we have always said. This is a new idea in Seventh-day Adventism. Dr. Adams takes the, uh, and this is again from Dr. Ford, Dr. Adams takes the popular Adventist view found in Ellen White's writings that the destiny of the human race hung in the balance when Christ came to earth. There was no absolute certainty that Christ would overcome and conquer and successfully complete the atonement. In other words, Christ could have sinned. And by the way, that's what Adventists have always believed, and that's what Ellen White has taught, that Christ could have sinned. Now notice what Desmond Ford said next. The salvation of the human race did not hang in the balance when Christ came. Success was absolutely certain. In other words, Christ could not sin. Christ, because he took a sinless nature and he was God, therefore he could not sin. Very interesting perspective on this from um, the Reformed branch of Christianity. Um, one of their leading scholars uh, said something like this. The possibility of Jesus sinning and falling is an atrocious idea. For then God himself must have been able to sin, which it is blasphemy to think. So that is exactly what Desmond Ford was saying, that Christ could not have sinned. So either he could not sin, according to Protestant evangelical thought, or he could sin, which is Adventist biblical thought. Did he come into the world as every son and daughter of Adam must come? Or did he come into the world completely exempt from the possibility of sinning by taking an unfallen nature? Another thought that came from a book that was um, published a little while back. 
um, by Donald Short called Made Like His Brethren. The offense taken at the biblical account of the Christ who was made like unto his brethren continues to be a stumbling block. Present solemn reality suggests that the ancient rejection of the chief cornerstone finds a parallel today in the church as many deny that the word was made flesh. And by the way, the word flesh means a nature subject to the fall. A nature as a result of the fall in both body and mind. And then he concluded, the question for the church to face today is when will Laodicea understand? Can she perceive how she has been shorn and stands naked? Can we with Samson learn from our own history? By consorting with the Philistines, we too have had the seven locks of truth shaved off our heads and so lost our mission. Compromise after compromise has been made. Now we are being told that we can shake ourselves and find strength apart from the truth that has sustained and made us a people throughout our history. We are told that such things as understanding the nature of Christ and righteousness by faith in an end-time setting are not essential to salvation nor for the mission of the church. We are falsely assured that the world church has never viewed these subjects as central and they should be laid aside for the, are, these are matters that Satan would use to take advantage of God's people. And so I agree that this is an area that um, has robbed us of something very important in our Adventist understanding of salvation. And by setting these subjects aside, we will open the door for serious errors to come in in our understanding of salvation. Just for a little point of reference, this was a statement by Hank Hanegraaff, who is the Bible answer man, not a Seventh-day Adventist. Listen to what he says. He's, he's going through the passages on uh, whether or not Sunday should be the right day of worship. In none of these passages is Sunday worship commanded. Christians are no more required to make Sunday their day of rest than they are to make Saturday their day of rest. However, of course, they are perfectly free to do so. In fact, to criticize Sunday observance and then to separate from the rest of the church over something like this is both legalistic and divisive. What he is saying is that if we insist on the seventh day Sabbath in contrast to the first day of the week, then we are separating from the rest of the church over something that is not very important. And he is asking us to set aside this divisive issue. Now, isn't that exactly what the uh, article in, in, uh, uh, the, from the Biblical Research Institute was saying? Let's set aside these issues because they are divisive and they don't help us to come to unity. I find that a parallel that I am not willing to accept. Truth cannot be set aside because it is inconvenient. Truth cannot be set aside because it does divide. The Sabbath truth divides. The truth about Jesus Christ coming down to this earth in our nature to complete the atonement and to give his last day people evidence that they can live without sinning, that does divide. But truth has always divided and always will. What we must pray for is God to pull together his people in true unity under truth and not apart from truth.